Howdy, this is Robert Corrick, and I published this book in 1986. It has two pages listing dynamic accumulators. In reality, it is basically the origin of most lists on the internet for dynamic accumulators. But first, what is the definition of a dynamic accumulator? Well, according to one permaculture person, it is, quote, a specific subset of plants that are especially well adapted based on their long tap roots to accumulating nutrients faster in higher quantities and from different sources than other plants. And today I'll be talking about stinging nettles as a dynamic accumulator and how they don't really have a deep tap root and yet they still accumulate lots of iron and other elements. Here's a page from my 1986 book that had dozens and dozens of dynamic accumulators and the elements that they were supposed to accumulate. So I went looking for some data instead of anecdotal information and I stumbled across Dr. James Duke. He was the only herbologist at the USDA and he did a lot of research of edible plants for both their low and high parts per million. And here we have a ranking of a bunch of plants and shows that stinging nettle is the highest of most edibles and that the inedible comfrey at 40,000 and the horse or tail at 80,000 may be higher than stinging nettle. This list for silicon and a number of other lists are available in my book Sustainable Food Gardens Myths and Solutions. So let's take a look at stinging nettles as a dynamic accumulator. They are high in amino acids, protein, and according to Dr. James Duke's work, iron and calcium. They are also a great source of vitamin K. And here's a grove of nettles uh, grown in a riparian habitat near a river. Here's a view looking down on the top of the leaf pattern of a stinging nettle. And here's what gives a stinging nettle its name. And how do you gather stinging nettle? Very carefully. Turns out dandelions are also accumulators. This is the only research I've been able to find on these weeds. It was done by people looking for alternatives to alfalfa. And here you see that dandelion is second in potash eighth in calcium, and third in phosphorus. Yes, dandelions certainly have a taproot here down to 7.25 feet. That's why they're so hard to eliminate. As a footnote, less than 5% of all trees have a taproot, and about 60-80% of the roots of a tree are in the top two feet. Here's a mullen with roots down to 10.5 feet but I haven't been able to find any science on mullen as a dynamic accumulator. So back to stinging nettle. Here's an amazing look at roots of a stinging nettle looking down from above. They are five feet wide. And here's an old lithograph that shows that roots begin as a small tap root but then diversify and become oblique roots with a fibrous root system. And here's a study from Germany that shows roots down to two feet or more, but no tap root. Here's another study from Germany with roots down about two feet. And here are the lamb's quarters. On the left, you see that the root system is only nine inches deep. And don't forget, Lamb's quarters have twice the amount of potassium as dandelions, but about the same amount of calcium. And here I'm digging stinging nettle roots, and you'll see that there's a ribosome, but no taproot. Here we see that nettles are the second highest amount of calcium, the highest phosphorus, and the fifth of potash compared to all these other weeds. 
And here we have the cross section of a nettle root zone with a tap root, well, maybe, but most of the roots in the top one to two feet. Now, Dr. Weaver studied a tremendous number of roots, and he determined that, quote, crops grown in soil of high fertility have roots that are shorter, more branched, and more compact than those in similar but less fertile soils. So maybe it's the soil condition that has more influence on accumulation than a taproot. In summary, I think dynamic accumulation is probably due to genetics, not necessarily a taproot. Just like all food has a variability of nutrients, I believe taproots are not required for dynamic accumulation. I devoted a whole chapter to this topic in my book, Sustainable Food Gardens, which I published just a few years ago. Here are the covers of my book, and the book is available on my website for 40 bucks. That's cheaper than anything on Amazon.